I wanted to share three things that I hear often, and many of my colleagues probably hear this too. Diversity is just about gender globally. Race is just a US issue. <laughs> there is diversity work to be done in Asia. We often hear that. And this panel that I'm about to introduce to you is going to share with you why it is so much more multidimensional and relevant around the globe. So right here I have Dr. Rohini Anand, who leads diversity, inclusion, and corporate responsibility at Sodexo. Sodexo is a great partner of, of ours in many, many ways. And what's um, interesting about Rohini's experience is that her diversity work is very personal. Having grown up in India as part of the majority and coming to the US for grad school and all of a sudden becoming a minority and a person of color, um, you know, it really informs the great work that she does around the globe today. Uh, next, we have Mark Fowler, who grew up in New York, knew diversity quite well in this great city, uh, but through his experience working for Tannenbaum, became very familiar with the concept of religious privilege. We hear a lot about a lot of types of privilege. Very often, we don't speak on religious privilege. So we're so happy to have you here today. And then my dear friend Karen, who leads DNI and talent for ENY globally, and you know brings to her work the credibility having been an accountant at EY in tax, no less, for most of her career, and then transitioning to the talent piece, and now having a seat as well on the US board. So not only, you know, she's leading from the front on all these very important issues. So being that we're Bloomberg, we're going to do a little data before we get down to brass tacks. So you know, if you look at the first chart that I'm going to share, you will see uh, that you may be surprised to learn that EMEA leads the global regions for companies with equal opportunity policies. And our next data that we'd like to share, while it's only 4%, right, and we're trying to change that number, the Americas leads the global regions when it comes to female CEOs. Finally, our last little nugget that we want to share, and all of this is available on your Bloomberg terminals, is that in the financial sector, you'll see that Asia region actually leads uh, all of the global regions when it comes to gender diverse CEOs. OK, so we've set the stage. And now we're going to turn to Dr. Anand my dear friend Rahini, who I think can really set the stage, so Dexo being such a large global company, share with us, when you think about the dimensions of diversity globally, what, it, you know, what do you think of? What does it comprise? Yeah, so I think that you know, when you think about the dimensions of diversity globally, I think there are many, right? You're talking about LGBT, you're talking about gender, people with disabilities, race, ethnicity, generations, etc. I think what's important is that each one of these have to be nuanced to the local context. So you talked about gender when you started, and you said that you know gender is something that can be measured globally. And I think one of the, I think it was a Bloomberg CEO that said, you can only make progress if you can measure, right? So that's one thing that you can measure. However, even with gender, it needs to be nuanced. And you know, when you talk about gender, it is about representation. It's about the advancement of women, development, engagement of women, in, both in the workplace as well as in the supply chain and in the community. Mm -hmm. However, the nuances are very specific. So just a quick example. You shared in the introduction that I grew up in India. Mm -hmm. So I went back to India um, after working for Sodexo for several years and wanted to do some work in India around advancing women. I thought I had all the answers. I went <laughs> in thinking that I, you know, we, we need mentoring, we need leadership development, et cetera, et cetera. I paused and asked the entry-level women managers what they wanted. And I had completely forgotten, having been in the United States for as long as I had, that a very important role of women in India is their role as a daughter-in-law. Mm -hmm. And so they said to me, they said, you know, we cannot work late in the office. When we go home, we still have to take care of the housework. We have to take care of the cooking for our in-laws. Can you help us? And I'm thinking, I don't know what I've you know, gotten myself into. How am I going to help you out of this one? But they came up with a solution. And they said, can we have a recognition day at Sodexo 
where we bring our extended families in mm -hmm. so that you can recognize us for the work we're doing. And that actually changed the dynamic for them when they went home because their in-laws took pride in you know, seeing the stuff they were doing. They no longer were sort of chastised for coming home late. Even some of the food was cooked when they came home. This, it's just an example to share that, you know, I, I think we go in with, with a mindset which is very North American. We go in, you know, the, the history of the work that we do is civil rights. And we go in with that mindset. And I think we need to really be a little bit more contextual in how we approach this. And I think each of these issues, even generations, you know, generational issues in India and China, it's about Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z. In, in Europe, it's about engaging baby boomers. So we need to really be nuanced and The generational piece is a perfect segue to Karen. 77% of EY's workforce are millennials. Yep. Talk to me about generational diversity. <laughs> <laughs> so I know a lot of people are tired of the word millennial, but just putting it into context, it's on average, depends on different countries around the world, but around uh, those under 35, 36. And the average age of an e-wire around the world is about 28. And if you think about that as compared to most companies around the world where the average is around 47, 48, it's quite different. We tend to trend about 2x faster than that because of our apprenticeship model. Um, I won't bore you with the details. But because of that, uh, we tend to have uh, twice as many. Mm -hmm. But that really, um, you, you could look at it different ways. It definitely keeps us on our toes. Uh, but it also forces us to be quite innovative and to be responsive to, to some of these needs that we're seeing. Uh, you know, as it relates to age differences in the workplace, I'll, I'll give you a few examples if I could. Um, you know, we're finding that we have to be far more transparent. We have to communicate far, far differently than maybe we did 10 years ago or 15 years ago as an organization. But that's proved to be very worthwhile. The other aspect is that we find ourselves um, listening much more often and proactively going out and asking our millennials uh, for feedback and for them to validate surveys that we might be doing. And that's not the illusion of listening. It's really listening. And it's proved to have business benefits. An example would be uh, we've done some external surveys, which we've validated internally. Um, some things that you might be interested to know, because if your companies aren't there yet, they might likely be. But um, Two times as many millennials are, are part of dual career uh, households as their previous counterparts in Gen X and boomers. That's significant. Their needs are different. Uh, we've also found that uh, men value um, flexibility just as much as women, if not even more. And they're more likely to leave for day-to-day -day flexibility than they might have, mm -hmm. might have compared to their uh, female counterparts. Lastly, both genders, um, men included, uh, value paid parental leave as being significant. And where it's not only a benefit to afford flexibility parental leave for employees, it's also a win-win for companies. Two things. Uh, we know that from the Peterson Institute, paid parental leave for men around the world, this is not a US phenomenon or just for some parts of the world, is a benefit uh, in the sense that paid parental leave for men is a pipeline builder for women. Uh, based on their studies, as well as a, a validating point for us. Uh, it really matters for business as well. Flexibility is our number one driver of retention around the entire world. Yes. And so, and that's for all generations. So we're seeing multiple generations are benefiting from the needs of millennials. Excellent. So I just found out I'm the average age of all of EY employees. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky all you. Right, <laughs> OK, so Mark. It used to be quite taboo to mm -hmm. talk about religion in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really changed. Mm -hmm. What are companies doing to address religious diversity in the workplace? Yeah, and I would start by saying that I don't, it may have been taboo, but people were talking about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were just talking about it in hushed tones and around the water cooler. And, but the conversation around religion has always been present. And because of sociopolitical um, conditions that we find ourselves in, it's even more present. Um, what we see a lot of companies engaging in are, if they're just starting their journey around religion, then they're looking at uh, faith-based employee resource groups. We've seen a huge uptick over the last two years in companies really exploring, developing, launching 
Uh, there are ERGs that are faith-based in a number of different models, and looking at that as a global imperative. So it's not just something that's happening in the United States. Uh, with all ERGs or business resource groups, there has to be a business imperative. And 89% uh, of the world's population identifies in some religious way that is around the entire globe. So there's not pretty much any place on the planet where you can find people that are not affiliated in some way with a religious belief practice or understanding. The other thing that we see in uh, companies uh, really digging into is the idea of quiet rooms that are available to all employees, regardless of whether they are of faith or not. And so we see serenity rooms, um, contemplation rooms, places where people can kind of take a moment away if they have obligatory prayers or uh, personal rituals that they want to engage in. There's space made for that. And it's interesting because what we notice is, is that the United States is actually catching up with the rest of the world where religion is so integrated in some parts of the world that you can get off a plane. I, the first time I got off the plane in Bangalore, the first thing I saw was the prayer room. Yeah. Yep. And before I saw the bathroom, before I saw, you know, that's the first thing that you see. And so we're, I think, kind of remodulating mm -hmm. the place and the comfort that we have with talking about religion as a workplace imperative. Excellent. So we've talked about a couple of dimensions now. And there's this word called intersectionality mm -hmm. that my dear friend Ella Bell often talks about. So let's talk about intersectionality when we think about what that means, global LGBTQI plus mm -hmm. you know, race outside of the US. Mm -hmm. I know we're doing a lot of work in Brazil around Afro-Brazilians, for example, which mm -hmm. people don't expect and used to be an unspoken just it is what it is. Right. So, you know, share with me, and I'll let any one of you jump in around the issue of intersectionality and diversity and inclusion. Well, I would just start by saying that um, when we, at Tannenbaum, when we look at religion, um, none, no one of us is ever one thing all the time. And the various ways in which we identify often shift and impact one another. And from the more you know, theoretical definition of intersectionality, we're also looking at places where a person's identity actually is a block or is a barrier to some kind of access, and the interplay of different identities will get in someone's way. So hmm. one of the things I think that's interesting is when we think about the experiences of Muslim people uh, globally, uh, we are definitely presented with a group of people who are very much under attack depending on how that's depicted or who comes to mind when we say the word Muslim has to do with a number of factors that may have to do with color that's not called race XUS. But when we think about who is the character of the person we think might be a terrorist or something along those lines, then we're talking about the interplay of religion, we're talking about the interplay of race, nationality, ethnicity, et cetera. And so there's this very complex interplay between uh, identities that we pay attention to because it impacts how people come to work. Rohini, you want to so, jump yeah, in? Yeah, if I yeah. can just add to that and amplify what Mark's saying. I think what you said is really important because it is that intersectionality mm -hmm. that often creates the barrier to access. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that intersectionality takes different forms, mm -hmm. um, but there's always an insider and outsider group. There's always yeah. an underrepresented group, mm -hmm. and it may be nationality, religion, race in mm -hmm. some contexts, mm -hmm. and others it is, it could be indigenous people. Yep. In other places, it could be caste, um, you know, education mm -hmm. levels. So I think it's all of these things together that we just really need to be, to be mindful of. But I think sort of an, in a global context, there is always sort of barriers to access, insider and outsider groups, and we need to kind of be mindful of the form and shape that takes in, in terms of intersectionality. Mm -hmm. Karen, do you want to add anything? <laughs> I, I guess one thing I would just add from a, a, from a U.S. context, Catalyst recently did a study talking about the in emotional tax mm -hmm. uh, placed on women of color, that it's be, be multiples, and there are uh, significant barriers there that we should all be very mindful of, and I think we have to be very intentional as organizations to remove some of those barriers, as Rohini has mentioned. It's, well, it's thank very you real. for that. All right, it's time to poll. Find your clickers. Find your clickers. Okay, let's see what our audience thinks while you take out your clickers. All right. My company focuses on dimensions of diversity other than gender. 
Agree, disagree, no clue. <laughs> That's not what it says. <laughs> Let's get the poll going. Okay, that's great. Okay, cool. That's fantastic. All right, we're going to go to the next poll question. Managers need to be equipped to discuss race, religion, and politics in the workplace. Not sure why it's ABC, not one, two, three, but you get the gist. <laughs> Agree, disagree, keep those conversations out of the office. What do we think? Hmm? Excellent. I think that's a big change from years past. Wonderful. Let's keep it going before we run out of time. So, you know, what do we think the role of government versus corporate should be in terms of showing leadership around driving DNI around the world? Karen, do you want to start with that? Uh, I, you know, I think that um, both are necessary, but I believe that probably more than ever before, companies have a big role to play. Uh, you know, with xenophobia being at an all-time high, as we've talked about throughout the day, I think companies um, have become, played a bigger role in becoming people's communities. And with that, they, um, in managers need to be able to provide safety, security, the ability for people to feel a sense of belonging. Um, and, and I do think that there are specific things that leaders can be very clear about. For example, if, if a company has an aversion to talking about quotas, they could talk about the business uh, results around um, uh, gender balance in the workplace. As an example, the Peterson Institute that I referenced earlier did a global study. They found uh, across 22,000 companies across 90 countries. So this is truly global. And they found that if you have at least 30% women on a management team, you had six percentage points more in net margin and 15% points more in revenues. That's not 6 and 15, that's 6 and 15 more. My point being that everyone should be armed as to why this is a business imperative, and, and, and this is just gender specifically, but there's broader than that, and, and the role that they can play in uh, making a substantive difference in economies um, outside of their company as well. Yeah, I would just add, I think that it is the entire ecosystem that needs to partner together to make change happen. If you look in the United States, the progress that we've made around LGBT has been largely driven by the corporate world. In other parts of the world, it's been legislation like quotas on boards for women in Europe, et cetera. So I think it, de it depends on where you are, but I do think it's a partnership between government um, and corporations in order to make progress. And I'll say that there was a, there was a McKinsey study where they looked at... Uh, you know, the position of women in the community, um, and if that was equal, it would generate an incremental $12 trillion of GDP. Mm -hmm. They also found that the position of women in the community, in society in general, impacts the position of women in countries, in corporations. So there's a clear correlation. It, it needs to be a clear partnership. And to, to Karen's point around, you know, defining this bu the business case, um, we've done something at Sodexo around gender balance, and we looked at data from... 50,000 managers, uh, 100 different entities over a five-year time period. And we correlated what we call gender balance with our key performance indicators. So employee engagement, client retention, employee retention, safety, and uh, gross margins. Mm -hmm. And then we found that teams with 40 to 60% women outperformed those with less than 40% women on every one of those key performance indicators. Mm -hmm. However, when you get more than 60% women, the results started plateauing. So in, in essence, it's not that one, any one group is better than the other, but you need that optimal mix. So as a result, we have put a stake in the ground and said that, you know, we know that 40 to 60% is our sweet spot. So we have targets where we hold managers accountable. So 40, we, we're, our target is 40% women by 2025 and it's linked to bonuses. And this year, for the first time, we're actually trying something new. We're linking our executives' performance shares to gender targets. And I don't know if anyone has done that, but we'll let you know how that works. <laughs> so that's a great uh, lead in to my last sort of, these are the hot round questions here. And, and one of the things I just want to share when you think about the role of government, we talk, you talked about quotas. And I know um, lots of companies, including ours, is doing a lot of work around disability based mm -hmm. on quotas, but really turning it into rich diversity work so that you're not just in compliance mode, but creating real opportunities for people with different abilities. So 
Down the line, yes or no? Quotas, yes or no? Yes. No. No. OK. <laughs> Targets, yes y or no? Yes. Yes. Big yes. <laughs> Excellent. Employee resource groups, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> I, I will say that all these things that I hate yes and no questions. <laughs> this, is, this is all contextual. It depends on your organization. It depends on the country. It depends on a bunch of things. Yeah. So I'll say yes to all depending on the context. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Excellent. What comes after inclusion? I think that it's diversity plus inclusion equals business breakthroughs. And I think the business breakthroughs are critical. And I also think that we have to get beyond just issues in the workplace to issues in the supply chain and the community. So to me, that's next. It's a more holistic 360 approach to diversity and inclusion where we're going beyond just our workplace to impacting society. Yes, Mark. Um, I think that the biggest issue is making sure that everyone's included. And so when we're talking about inclusion from, if, from church days, from the pulpit to the door, that means everyone from the mailroom to the CEO's office is included. And what then happens is true innovation, not making something a little bit nicer than it used to be, <laughs> but actual complete new models of the ways in which we even think about commerce, interacting with one another, and what respect looks like in the workplace. Karen, bring us home. So we still have a lot of work to do on inclusion yeah, before we sure. move off of that. And this isn't necessarily a technical term, but what I would envision as being beyond inclusion is cohesion. Mm. And I would look at it as that all di differences are represented in a, in a workplace, but you no longer see those stitch marks where you're trying to make it happen, uh, but it's more of a seamless team. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you guys. I want to thank you for listening. I think diversity does lead to disruption, does lead to innovation, and this summit is proof of that. Thank you. Thank you.